Okay, hello and welcome to our video on dual homing theory. In this video we're going to talk about what dual homing is, uh, why, we, why we would use it, that type of thing. We're going to have a look at how it works, the mechanics behind it all. We're going to have a look at the... Um, we're going to give you a breakdown of the high level steps, what you need to do to set it up. We're not going to discuss the details of that, either by the command line or the GUI. Uh, those will be covered in a different video. Um, but this will give you like sort of a high level overview, a breakdown of what needs to be done to get it working. And uh, there's two flavours of dual homing and we'll discuss the two flavours in this video. Okay? Okay, so we have two switches in this diagram connected together. Uh, the important point to note is that the two switches have two links between them, two physically separate links. Now, what this means is that um, the switch can send the data down this link or the switch can send the data down this link. Now if anybody's worked with Ethernet for uh, any period of time you'll come across a problem called a broadcast storm and what a broadcast storm is is basically because of the way switches talk to each other uh, if you have redundant links without any kind of management the switches will simply send the messages the broadcast messages from one switch to another back and forth back and forth indefinitely so what you need to do to prevent this is you need to have some kind of management now normally that management is done using a protocol called STP or some variation on it uh, however where dual homing comes in is dual homing gives you an alternative method for providing redundancy than simply relying on dual, uh, spanning tree protocol alone okay now redundancy uh, just to cover that here so we're all on the same page redundancy is simply uh, being able to deal with problems on your network so if a switch goes down you don't want the whole network to go down with it you want the network to be able to manage that failure you want it to be able to react and you want it to be able to continue to operate with as minimal impact as possible uh, another example of redundancy is here so if something happens to one of these links we always have a spare link, a backup link, which can be used so these two switches can still talk to each other. There's no operational impact. They can still communicate. Yes, we have a failure, but we're able to deal with that failure. And that type of um, uh, network management is covered under the banner of redundancy. redundancy. So just to recap, we've got two connections. One, two. One's the active in this case signified by a green connection green means go all your traffic is being sent between these two switches over the green connection and we have a standby connection here the standby connection it, it's not down it's important to know that it's not down it's not broken in any way it's there it's working it's ready to be used it's just that the switches have chosen not to use that link now it's there ready and waiting for something bad to happen to the active link so that it can take over and that's its sole purpose so it's amber, it's not red, it's not down, it's amber, it's ready to go. This one's green, it's all the traffic's going over that link. So uh, in the next slide we'll talk about, we'll give you a live fire demonstration of how it all fits together. Okay, so as I said, the green link is your active link. And the amber link is your backup, it's your standby. Okay, so the active link fails and the backup is immediately used. So we're going to create some uh, bit of drama on the network and we're going to take this link down. Bang! It's gone down. It's gone from green to red. All of a sudden the switch goes, oh no, I can't see a, an active link signal on this link anymore. I'm just going to assume it's not working. And what I'm going to do is, I was going to send all my traffic down this link, but I'm not going to do that anymore. I know I have a backup link. I've set up dual homing on this switch. I have a backup here ready and waiting to be used if I need it. I need to use it now. So let's turn it on. Let's send the traffic down this link. And all of a sudden, the link's back up. These switches can still talk to each other. We've had a link failure. You know, that link has gone down. But because we have an active link and we've lost that connection, but we have a backup link ready and waiting to take over in case it's needed, we are able to deal with this link failure. And ultimately, that is all that dual homing is. It's just having a, a spare link there, ready and waiting to take over, just in case anything happens to your active link. And it also provides this functionality by dealing with the problem of switching loops, broadcast storms. 
Uh, this uh, slide here is just basically to cover one of the points is that uh, you do need the Garrett.com switch to set up dual homing, okay? However, that switch can be connected to any make or model switch you like. It could be a Cisco switch, it could be a Freecom switch, doesn't really matter. Because dual homing is built on Ethernet standards, yes you do need a Garrett.com switch to set it up on, but if you have other switches in your network which that switch is connected to, it's no problem at all. It can handle any make or model switch you like. Okay, all right. Um, we can now move on to the topic of setting it up. What we need to do is to set up uh, dual homing. Okay, so as I said, there's two different flavors of dual homing, and you'll need to tell the switch which one of those flavors you want to use, which t which mode of dual homing, which type of dual homing you want to use. So we'll need to do that first. Then once we said, said um, we told the switch which mode we want to use, we'll need to tell it which of those ports we want to use. So we have a switch, we have say five ports, one, two, actually I'm going to cancel, I'm give it four ports because I'm running out of space. I'm just going to say I want to use this port here and this port here to be my two dual homing ports. Okay, so you need to tell the switch which type of dual homing you want, which flavor you want to use, which ports you want to be using uh, you need to uh, turn dual homing on once uh, you've specified the type, the ports, you need to turn it on and finally you need to connect your cables once you have it all configured. It doesn't necessarily have to be done like that. You can have the cables connected and then set it up but it generally it's just best uh, as a best practice to connect your cables after you set things up because um, if you have spanning tree protocol running at the same time, spanning tree protocol can get a little bit over eager and it might actually disable one of these links on you. So you might end up having to unplug the cables and then plug them back in. So generally it's best to uh, to uh, connect your cables last after setting it up. As I said, it doesn't have to be done that way. It's not necessarily going to cause you a problem, but you know, you know, just make your life easier. Connect your cables after you set it up. Okay, so um, <clears throat> in this slide we're going to talk about some of the potential problems, kind of some of the caveats, if you like, of uh, what you need to remember to use dual homing. And the first one is, as I said on the previous slide, generally it's best to connect the cables after you've configured it first, just to make your life easier. It's considered best practice. Finally, uh, forgive me, next uh, we have uh, a bit of a... Uh, you know, uh, a functional limit. You can only have two ports on each switch set up to be dual homing ports. I.e., you can only have one pair of uh, ports per switch. So the ports in blue are going to be my dual homing ports. Uh, ports in green are not. What I'm going to have is, you know, I want to have two more. So I want these two to be dual homing to one switch, and these two to be dual homing to another switch. Uh, uh you can't do that. Not, not allowed, it's against the rules. So it's just one of those uh, stipulations that you can't have more than one pair of dual homing ports per switch. Okay, that's a bit of a negative rule. Okay, so that's a bit of an unhappy phase, but this one here is, you know, this one's a real plus. This one's a real plus because uh, of those two ports on a switch, you can choose whatever two ports you want. They could be different type, they could be fiber, one could be copper, they could be 10 100. Uh, another one could be a gig, doesn't matter. Uh, you can have a switch where one of the ports is on one of the modules and uh, another one of the ports is on a different module. Basically, you can choose whichever two ports you want to be your two dual homing ports. And the final sort of um, uh, final sort of uh, tip, if you like, is once you've told the switch what type you want to use, which ports you want to use, you need to make sure you tell the switch to, to go ahead and use dual homing to sort of turn it on to get it up and running. Okay. Okay, as promised, uh, we need to discuss at this point the two different flavors of dual homing. So, two different modes that you can use. Now, best illustrated with an example. Okay, so we have the first one, number, number one, uh, is equivalent. Okay, so the two ports that you selected to be your dual homing ports, they're the same. It doesn't really matter which one is the active and which one's the backup. It doesn't really matter. So normally, what means what it means in this situation is they're normally the same speed. 
Okay, so it, it doesn't make a difference if you're using this link as the active or this link as the, the, the active. It doesn't really. There's, there's no. Um, you know, it doesn't make a difference. Okay, so uh, in the event of um, a failure, so this one here is the active port, and the one next to it is your standby. Okay. Now there's a problem on the network, and all of a sudden this link goes down. Dual homing being dual homing, working like magic, steps in and just turns on the, the, the backup port, and that becomes your active port. Okay. Now your network engineers, they're, they're, they're really good. All right. Now five minutes later, they've got the link fixed, back up and running. Now nothing happens. It doesn't make a difference. All that happens is the link which went down now becomes a standby. It's it's fair, it's ready to be used, but this link doesn't take control over the 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 one which just took over. There's no usurping. There's no coup involved. There's no failover. Just because this used to be the active link before doesn't mean that when it comes back up, it's going to be the active link again. And the the if you want it to work like that, if it doesn't really make a difference which one is the active one and which one's the standby one, it's generally best to leave it at the default, which is equivalent mode just to make your life easier. Why add unnecessary complication to your network design? Okay. However, in the second example we have um, we have okay we have these two ports you select. Alright, the first one is a gig, okay? And the second one is only 10 meg. Now you don't mind having uh, using the 10 meg if you need to, but generally you're going to want to be using the gigabit ports whenever you possibly can. Okay, so we're going to set up the gigabit port as the primary, yeah, okay? and we're going to set up the uh, 10 meg as the secondary. All right, now we have the uh, madness happens and this link goes down. Right, straight away the the backup link comes up, and everyone's happy. Okay, now this the 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 one which went down comes back up. Now because it's a primary, because you always want to be using that one most of the time, as soon as it comes back up, there's going to be um, a failover, a fail back if you like. So if it's set to primary, it will always take control whenever it can take control. Whenever it's up and running, it will be, it will be the active link. So what happens is this one takes over again and the standby, which is now, which was active, goes back to being standby. Okay? And if you want it to work like that, you have to use primary secondary mode. Okay, this is the final slide in our topic on dual homing theory. I just want to basically cover the two caveats um, to using primary secondary mode. So if you do want to use a primary secondary mode, that type of flavor of uh, dual homing, uh, you will need to tell the switch as an additional configuration step which of the two ports you want to be the primary and which of them you want to be the secondary. Okay, And the final caveat is that if you are going to use primary and secondary mode, that particular flavor, you can only use it on managed switches. Now there are some unmanaged switches in our inventory uh, which support dual homing, however they only support the equivalent mode. Okay. And that's it. That's uh, That concludes our discussion on dual homing theory. I'd like to uh, thank you for watching and I hope this has been helpful for you.